Welcome to week four of U.S. history. So let's take a look at the objectives we're going to cover this week. So we're still on establishing the new nation. We're still in the days of the early republic. And we're going to talk about Hamilton's plans for the economy and the opposition to them. So we're going to think in debate form, in argument and counter argument form. So Alexander Hamilton was the first secretary of the treasury under President George Washington. Secretary of the treasury, you can think of it today as being the minister of finance. In some countries, that is the official title. So Hamilton was a key figure in shaping the economic policies of the United States during its early years. His economic vision was instrumental in setting the country on a path towards economic stability and growth. Now, we're going to talk about Hamilton's plans for the economy. It can get a little technical, but what we want to do is just grab the main concept of each one to try to simplify it as much as possible. And we have no need for the extra details or the economic jargon for our purposes. So first, uh, the was the of his plan was the federal assumption of state debts. So Hamilton proposed that the federal government assume and pay off the individual state debts incurred during the Revolutionary War. This would consolidate the nation's debt and establish federal credit. Now, what's important for me and for you to know in this aspect is that the central government basically paid off the debts of the individual states. This is what I want you to know out of his plan. You don't have to think about the consolidation of debt or the establishment of federal credit. So second, he created a national bank. He advocated for the establishment of the first bank of the United States, which would provide a stable currency, manage government funds, and promote economic growth. Today, we know these to be as central banks. They are a necessary aspect of every nation. Hamilton also believed in a strong industrial and manufacturing sector and proposed protective tariffs to shield American industries from foreign competition. So what does that mean in today's terms? So let's say it costs something to um, to create in Jordan. It costs one JD to create, whereas in China it costs the equivalent of 30 cents. What he did was ban imports from China, say in this case, so that Jordanian manufacturers could um, could have the market share. This is what a protective tariff is. So that's what he did to shield Americans from foreign, mainly European competition. And fourth, he promoted a national currency. He pushed for a national currency. We explained that the states did not have a one unified currency. The dollar was not there. And this currency would be backed by the federal government to facilitate economic transaction and reduce dependence on foreign currencies. Now, Hamilton's plans faced significant opposition, primarily from Thomas Jefferson and his allies. They believed Hamilton's policies favored the wealthy and were detrimental to agrarian interests. Agrarian, they being as the more of the agricultural and working class uh, segment. So this opposition laid the foundation for the emergence of a two-party system in the new nation. Now, the divide between the supporters of Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Party and Thomas Jefferson's Democrat-Republican Party marked the emergence of the, na- of the nation's first political parties. These parties had fundamentally different versions for the future of the country. So Hamilton's was called the Federalist Party, and Thomas Jefferson's was known as the Democratic-Republican Party. So today, we know we have Democrats on one hand, Republicans on the, on the other. At the time, during Thomas Jefferson's reign, there was just one party called the Democratic Republican Party. So Federalists advocated for a strong central government, while Democratic Republicans wanted more um, state rights. Uh, they wanted a more decentralized system and a strict interpretation of the Constitution. So... Um, They were more sympathetic, you could say, to things like the French Revolution, and they favored a a more loose form of government. So we'll move on to some of the territorial expansion and conflicts. 
So as the United States expanded westward during the 19th century, it encountered various challenges. One of them was the conflicts with the British in the Northwest. The British maintained forts in the region and provided support to Native American tribes resisting American expansion. This tension eventually culminated in the War of 1812. So we will talk about the War of 1812 in more detail in the next unit. Uh, simultaneously, westward expansion led to clashes with Native American nations who faced displacement and loss of their ancestral lands. Conflicts such as the Northwest Indian War and the Creek War highlighted the complex relationships between the Native Americans and the expanding U.S. government. Lastly, let's describe a little bit American relations with Britain, France, and Spain during the period. So relations with Britain, as we said, were strained due to unresolved issues from the Revolutionary War, trade disputes, and the British support for Native American resistance. These tensions, as we just mentioned, eventually led to the War of 1812. Uh, relations with France were initially positive due to French support during the American Revolution. However, the French Revolution and subsequent conflicts in Europe complicated this relationship. The XYZ affair and the Quasi War strained diplomatic ties. We will talk about these two major events also in Unit 5. Relations with Spain were influenced by territorial disputes, particularly regarding the Mississippi River and the port of New Orleans. The 1795 Treaty of San Lorenzo, Pinky's Treaty, also known as Pinky's Treaty, eased some of these tensions. These interactions with European powers showcase the challenges of maintaining neutrality and protecting American interests in the face of global conflicts, setting the stage for future diplomatic endeavors and foreign policy decisions. So I hope that was a brief enough summary of the week ahead, and I look forward to seeing you all in class as we delve deeper into these topics. Thank you.